I'm an artist in residence here at Bloom Bars. Uh, that means that um, I help out with the programming here. I host the uh, open mic once a month, but that happens uh, weekly on Monday nights. I also ho host a songwriting workshop, so if you all are interested in um, writing some music, um, you can come to that. I have a band in the area. It's called Elena and Los Fulanos. We do bi bilingual folk rock, um, and... Um, and I'm really excited to be here tonight, and I'm really excited y'all decided to come out and share this time with me um, because uh, I've been a musician in the area for like three or four years and trying to do music kind of as my profession, and, um, and I brand myself as a Nicaraguan American artist. And as time went on, I really started to realize that um, I wasn't really sure what it, that meant. Um, and so when John offered me to be an artist in residence here, um, I thought it would be a really cool opportunity to really delve into my culture and really um, find out more about the tradition that I come from. Um, so my, my background, so you guys all know the context here, is that um, I was born in the States um, in 84, which was during the Nicaraguan Revolution, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but, um, and I grew up here until, so my, p my family was part of the exiled one. So they were basically people who fled the war because they were antagonized by communism for whatever reason. Um, and so, um, or I'll say communism, <laughs> like that. Um, and so I, um, in 92, I moved back to Nicaragua. So I was about eight years old when we moved back. And, uh, and I was very Americanized when I moved there and I went to an American school and I continued speaking English and then I came back for college. And I really, um, I, I loved music. I've always been a musician. I've always sung and everything, but I never, um, all of the music that was from Nicaragua, I really associated it with my parents' generation. And, um, and I didn't really feel like I related to it. Um, and so now that I'm a musician and, and, and being Nicaraguan American, I realized um, I really started to delve into the treasure that is where I come from and really started to think more about that, more intentionally about where I come from and really realize that if you don't know where you come from, you can't know where you're going. So um, in that spirit, uh, I have decided to do launch this Central American Culture and Justice series. And this is, you guys are my guinea pigs. This is the first uh, first installment of it and the first um, try with this. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. We're going to talk about, uh, the, the series itself will be broader than Nicaragua. It will be about Central America. I'd like to um, use music to explore culture, history, geography, etc., of the region of Central America that has so many pe that so many people have migrated to the U.S. from, but um, I feel like even though people live in our midst, sometimes we don't know a lot about the area. Um, and so this is kind of an attempt to kind of give a little more depth to our understanding of the area. Um, but I figured the for the first installment, I could I would start at home, and so um, I decided to go with Song Nika, which is probably the most Nicaraguan music that there is and we'll go into all the things around that um cool how many of you have been to bloom bars before cool most of y'all cool uh well welcome to bloom bars uh we have existed here since 2007 and uh bloom bars has won best arts and culture nonprofit for the last four years um the man in the boat up there is john chambers and he helps run the sound and i would like to give him a round of applause I call him El Capitan. Um, and uh, if you all, if this is all volunteer run, it's all ages all the time. So if you're interested in volunteering for our events or you know coming to coming out again, talk to John. And also Melanie's in the back helping us out with volunteering today. So give her a round of applause. Cool. I think that's most of it for the introduction. Um, I want to start us off with a song. Um, this one is La Mora Limpia, which um, some people uh, consider it to be um, the like, second national anthem. There's kind of like two songs that are considered second national anthem of Nicaragua, and this is one of them. Um, it has no words, but um, I'll be accompanied by Jorge Anaya today, who will be playing guitar with me. So. <laughs> Thank you. 
As if this wasn't going to be awkward enough with all this stuff upstage. I put on this crazy dress. <laughs> I just got it, though. It's like the second time I wear it, so I'm really excited. Muchas gracias. Jorge got the hard part on that song. <laughs> cool. So, um, so the whole idea with this is uh, to kind of intersperse music with information and hopefully give context. Yeah. Sorry about that. But we're good now. You guys could still hear, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, it was good. You did awesome. Another round of applause for Jorge and I. 
Um, so, um, so I'm going to do a little bit of background um, about Nicaragua. I didn't assume any kind of um, previous knowledge of Nicaragua. I was like, I'm going to start really basic so people can all be on the same page. So uh, we're going to do a quick little geography lesson for everyone. There's some stuff that we have in our country, <laughs> uh, including our map. I mean, our, our flag. Oh, OK. It's changing colors, too. Um, so a couple things that we're known for. We're known for like um, beautiful landscapes. There's volcanoes and lakes. It's a tropical country, and it's pretty awesome. We also have beautiful colonial cities. And we also have like war, <laughs> which is what we're known for. Um, uh, so. So oh. this is where we are. Now, the proximity to the US will play a very important role in the future for this presentation. Um, but uh, so basic stuff. Well, Columbus first landed there, but there were a bunch of people that lived there before Columbus came. A lot of that culture has actually been erased, um, unfortunately, um, through after the, during the Spanish conquest. So a lot of the people that lived there um, uh, apparently a lot of them got um, sent to other places in um, the Spanish crown uh, to work as slaves. And so um, a lot of the culture that exists in other parts, I think the population in Nicaragua was smaller than like in Mexico and in Guatemala and stuff. And so a lot of the cultures that you see like really vibrant there um, in Nicaragua growing up for me, I never saw anybody speaking like an indigenous language. Um, so really the only vestiges of like indigenous culture that we do have are in our music, at least that from what I've been able to um, to research. Um, some of the things that are some of the aspects that have been really important um, during our history have been so the divide between the east and the west. Um, so oh, this isn't as clear as I thought it was, but it's cool. Um, so the west side is where like the major like colonial Spanish cities are. And then the east side is actually um, a very different demographic. And it's because we have like mountains and, and jungle in the middle. So it's a very divided country. And actually another part of the series that I do want to focus on is um, the stuff that happens on the east side, which is mostly Afro um, descent, like indigenous, the few indigenous that we have that like have been speaking um, their languages and kept a lot of their culture. The few um, tribes that we have are on the east side and they also have mixed with um, people of African descent. And so um, they have, and they were also colonized by the British initially. And so they have a very different culture than the west side, which was um, a lot more mestizo, although a lot very also had um, Afro, um, descendants as well, but it's been a little bit more kind of mestizoized, if you will, kind of like people got folded into this one singular identity. Um, and there aren't like, there wasn't as much of a presence of, um, indigenous culture on, on the West side. Um, the other really big thing that kind of plagued Nicaragua's history has been um, this uh, conflict between the conservatives and the liberals. Uh, the conservatives were based down here in Granada, and the liberals were based in Leon, and there was like a lot of warring between the two. And actually, part of the reason that that's really important is because they both kind of hearkened to the US for intervention um, in those wars, and it ended up like, it ended up having a lot of American influence in our history. So we'll talk about specific place times when that it, that had an impact, and especially in the development of Songnika. And at the time that it was developed, um, uh, there was there was some of that element there in the creation there. So um, let's do another song. So okay. Some of the stuff that's really important. So one of the things that's the most important that has been left from um, our indigenous um, uh, ancestors is that uh, is the marimba. And the marimba is super unique. So it exists in other parts of Central America, but um, it's actually a little different. So there's two different kinds of marimbas. One, the theory is that one came from the north, from Mexico, and it's the one that's like this, which is the one that they actually play. Um, um, they play, it's more like a piano, so it has all the notes. Um, 
that's not the one we play in Nicaragua. The one we play in Nicaragua is like that one, which I'm about to play in the next song, which is um, one that's made with an arc. And that one is thought to have descended um, from uh, people of African descent who brought over to the Americas um, the balafone, what is now known as the balafone. Um, and they mix with the indigenous culture in um, an area of Nicaragua called Monimbo. And that's uh, actually also known now as the cradle of our culture. Um, it's most of where most of marimba is played. It's also where I got this dress made. And uh, it's where they do all the traditional dances. It really, they have like events there all the time. If you walk down the street on any day, you'll hear marimbas playing um, and people dancing. It's pretty awesome. Um, oh, this is a balafone right here. I put that on there. So this is, this is the, actually the instrument that we derive it from, that we derive ours from instead of this one, which is more traditional for the rest of Central America. So we actually, Jorge and I just did a, a show where we showcased different, uh, it was all about marimbas and all of the countries, basically all the countries, right, used the, this one marimba and then Nicaragua uses this one. So I, I participated as the marimba player because um, apparently there aren't that many in the <laughs> DMV area who, and that many people who play marimbas de arco. Who would have thought? So, um, so um, did you let me, let's play a song on that. I'll do a quick intro of this song. So I actually started learning this song. Um, I I got the marimba before I knew how to play it, and I just decided to buy it and bring it to, to, to DC. And so I've just been looking up like YouTube videos and things to see what I could learn how to play. Um, and uh, this one is just like a song that I remembered hearing and that I really wanted to learn. And I finally, f they don't have word, the song, the, most of the marimba songs don't have words. And so um, I just started playing this one, and then I found out what it was called. Um, and it's actually, actually, it's known as Aquella Indita, which means um, that little Indian or indigenous woman. But it's actually apparently the the correct um, uh, the correct name for it is just Aquella, which is like that one. Which so I'm not really sure if it even refers to a person, but um, I, I just took a marimba class, and that's what they told me. So. Um, I'm assuming that's right. She was from Monimbo, so...
So the most important part, the most important part element of that um, to what it became Song Nika. So that's called Song de Marimba, which is a really important um, a part of our folklore. It's it's com considered a lot more folkloric than Song Marimba, uh, Song Nika, which we're going to talk about, which is a lot more pop. Um, but it, it that song, that style of music, um, the rhythmic pattern influenced what would become Song Nika. So um, what I'm going to do right now is play a song from Song Nika. Um, and we're going to talk about more about the background there, but uh, I actually have lyrics printed out for folks to follow along. And um, oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, so there should be two. I think two pages. Ooh, these are really thick. Some of these are really thick pages. There should be two pages. Let me see. to is called El Nandaimeño. Nandaimeño. Uh, and I guess I'll wait. <laughs> Actually, you know what? We'll do we'll do a second another one that's from um, Song de Marimba and it's with a, a presentation like <laughs> it's with a dance.
So I think like the so the most important element from that so that's not song nika that's like song de marimba but basically the rhythmic eth- element of that that Jorge was playing the rakachung that becomes the cornerstone of song nika. So now let's hear an example before before we get much further here. <laughs> Camilo Zapata, that's uh, that's the person who wrote this song, and he's like the father of Song Nika. And the really important part about this is that this is really like a time in history when he writes this. This is like in the um, his uh, this is in like the 1930s, um, and it's a time where Nicaraguan identity is really starting to form. So Nicaragua became um, independent in 1821, and then they've had like all these wars. And then what happened is that. Um, they had American. Well, let me see. Let me let me go in order here. They had American intervention um, during that time. I'll come back to that slide. Um, so there was basically an American op- occupation of Nicaragua during the 1930s, and the end. T- to not get bore you with like a lot of detail, the end of that ended up being the setting up of something called the National Guard in Nicaragua. And the National Guard was basically an American like backed force. It was a like an American backed um, army that ended up, um, the head of it ended up becoming the dictator and the head of the dynasty of the Somoza dynasty for 60 more years. Um, so he, Camilo Zapata, is coming to uh, to start writing music right at this time. It's a time where like um, there's other art- artists coming out and writing um, poetry, lots of poetry around um, Nicaraguan identity and something that's like setting them apart. Before this moment, all Nicaragua, all the music that was played in Nicaragua was like mostly stuff from outside. So it was like 
Mexican music or things that were brought from like an external, like the other parts of Latin America mostly. But this was the first time anything like a uniquely Nicaraguan was was created. Um, and it was based on this rhythmic d guitar. So let me go back to the elements now. Oh, um, I can show you these people. Okay, so Sandino's a really important guy. This guy right here? Um, so during the American occupation, he was one of the people that fought against it. And he said we didn't want, they didn't want... Um, Americans to have so much influence in Nicaragua and so it was a time of big strife there was actually like three people that were like sort of like controlling the country one of them was Sandino uh, the other one was like the president which apparently didn't have any power and then the third guy was that guy over there who was the head of the National Guard and eventually Sandino was murdered in a very mysterious incident that is attributed to that guy but it's totally not clear but there's there's a lot of speculation a lot of, about a lot of history in Nicaragua. It's really weird. I feel like I can't make any statements. Um, but these are the American Marines, you know, that, like, were fighting against Sandino, and they caught one of his flags. So I think it's just really interesting to see how much American influence, like, really played into that. So this was, like, a really big period of transition um, when Camilo Zapata decided to write music. He was actually a topographer, and he got to travel a lot around the country, and so he actually decided to write songs about a lot of different cities and stuff, and he brings that in. Um, so, um, so back here. So Songnika is identified by a couple things. First of all, it's super basic, and people still basically play with the, the arrangement of marimba de arco, guitar, and guitarria, which um, I don't know if you've heard this, but I went and asked them what this, so it was a little guitar. It's like a, it's, so, it's sort of like a ukulele. And I went and asked them what the strings were made out of, and they said bicycle, like, bi wire. You think that's possible? <laughs> so I don't know. It's crazy. I don't know. It's like you ask people questions, and they give you the strangest answers, and you're like, there's no books about this, so I guess I'll have to go with this information, right? <laughs> Still, yeah, they were very, yeah. So, um... So uh, it basically plays the role that uh, Jorge has been playing, which is the requinto, which is known as like the solo, kind of like the soloing guitar. And then later on, they added percussion. But this is like the pure style of marim, uh, of of um, of songnica with marimba guitar and guitarrillo. It usually uses major chords. I have found that I've we've been learning some songs here for for this presentation that doesn't stay in major. But um, I think that the reason for that is because the marimba is in um, is in D major, and most of the songs that they play traditionally in Nicaragua is in D major, although you could play a minor scale. But um, I think that's the reason why. And then again, the most uh, the m the most important characteristic is the rhythm that is played in the guitar. And so, can you can you give us a, like a little example? Oh, is it off? <laughs> that is what is. The foundation, like the cornerstone of Sonica. Cool, let's hear another song. So, oh wait, not, not for us. I'm going to play another song, oh. sorry. So I wanted to learn like some Camilo Zapata stuff, but like all his songs have like a million words in like this much time. So I couldn't do it, but it's it's good. It's good stuff. This this next one's called El Solar de Monimbo. And this one's all about Monimbo, which is the area where the marimba is played and where I got this dress made. It's in this city called Masaya. And it's actually the indigenous part of, of Masaya where the Chorotega used to live, which is the indigenous tribe that mixed with uh, the people of African descent. So here I'm going to play El Solar de Monimbo. Zapateando, zapatea y nada más. Hay que ver a doña. 
ya Inés pa' bailar Como zapate y a la vez Y hace la cadera temblar Pues el consejo que le da Para comparar igual para bailar Hace de para allá no te vengas No tan arrecostado Pareces un gallo remojado Pegadito, guancho nada más Pegadito, guancho nada más Cuidadito, pues no me tocas Another um, really important characteristic of um, song nika, which had never been heard before in music, is that it uses like Nicaraguan slang like crazy. So it, a lot of people know Spanish, but and you might read these lyrics and be like, I don't know half of these words, and it's because they really rely very heavily. And Nicaraguan culture is a uh, is um, it does rely like it's very important, like the kinds of language that you use with people, like um, it can create relationships in a different way. So. Um, how, how do I explain this? Nicaraguans are a very informal culture and they like to become really chummy with you very quickly. And one of the ways that they do that, I don't know, you live there, right? That's kind of how it is. Like people are super outgoing and very friendly. And one of the ways that they do that is by using this language that is very like, it's very chummy and sometimes a little bit like, a little too chummy, but um, but it's it's definitely like a characteristic of our culture that's very important. So that's a really important part of Song Nika that um, that became part of it with um, Camilo Sa Camilo Zapata, and then was continued um, most importantly by Los Mejia Godoy. So we're gonna move to the next. So Carlos Mejia Godoy is probably one of the most important figures in Nicaraguan music in the last. 30 years and he did all kinds of genres but uh the most important thing that he did was to like really instill a lot more national pr pride in in being Nicaraguan um during the revolution so we'll talk about that but first we'll play um a song Hagamos Maria de la Guardia so that we've got the lyrics to this one Um, this one is it's so I think I uh, I told you that um, the guardsmen so the National Guard was the basically the strong arm of Somoza of Somoza and Somoza dictatorship and Somoza th Somoza was a uh, our president and he had two sons and they both became president after him um, and so it was like 60 years of rule or something like that 
Um, so um, the, the buildup that happened is that he was actually pretty repressive and he used the guard to, well, I'll say he for like all the Somosas, um, but um, used the guard as the strong arm to like oppress people. He really limited freedom of speech and a lot of stuff. Um, and this song I think is really interesting because not only talks about women, um, women's role at the time, because it's sort of about like a prostitute type person or someone who like hangs out with the National Guard a lot. But I also think it's really interesting that it, he tells it from the National Guard. Uh, she tells it from the perspective of um, being involved with guardsmen, which I think is like actually much more of a critique of the National Guard. And I think it speaks to what happened at that time, which is that people were speaking out um, against against Somoza and against the National Guard. So um, this one is called um, Maria de los Guardias, and it's Maria of the Guards Men. So. Yo soy la María de Razo Potos En antes perdí la inocencia de tener experiencias de Teniente Cosme También quiero palabrearles que fui medio novia de Sarmiento Guido Lo que pasa es que ese jaño que hace 15 días que fue transferido Yo soy la María, María es mi gracia Pero a mí me dicen María de los guardias Yo soy la María, María No ando con razones, razones Ya llevo en mi cuenta por cuenta Cinco batallones Yo nací en el comando, mi mamá cuidaba al capitán Gandique Porque esta techo es muy grande, ella no me tuvo en el mero tabique No es que me las pique de ser que la guarda la reina y señora Pero mi primera pacha lo chupé a Chihuina de una cantimplora Yo soy la María, María es mi gracia Pero a mí me dicen, María de los guardias Yo soy la María Ando con razones, razones Ya llevo en mi cuenta por cuenta Cinco batallones Cuando me mataron mi primer marido Fue durante el tiroteo En un arrecho y a modo sandino A mi varón me rotando No hay la tenguita por el rapado Yo lo vi del pobrecito Todo pasconeado como un colador Yo soy la María María es mi gracia Pero a mí me dice María de los guardias Yo soy la María, María Ando con razones, razones Ya llevo en mi cuenta por cuenta Cinco batallones Que mi propio pasa me puso en estanco Para chequearse de fijo por aquellos días que él salía franco Mingo lo tenía patente puesto en camisilla de hombre de pila 
decía María? <risa> Como él era medio poeta, me decía Flor de Bartolina, yo soy la María. María es mi gracia, pero a mí me dicen María de los guardias. Yo soy la María, María, no ando con razones, razones. Ya llevo en mi cuenta por cuenta cinco batallones. Actually, uh, is there a Flor de Bartolina? Uh, Do you know what that meaning, is? Uh, uh, from the from the gar the gar flower. I think uh, it's just a nickname. Like it's just like a uh, like a nature. Bartolina is it from the, the gars and the uh, flor flower of the thing. Gar flower. So like he took away her identity and just called her. Yeah, he just decided to call her whatever he wanted to. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot in this song. <laughs> Honestly, I had never, I've heard this song like a million times and I have never, I hadn't really thought about what it all said. And I think it's really interesting that like these are the things that are so common in our, in Nicaraguan culture and they're so packed full with like justice stuff, you know, like there's so much criticism in this. And these were the songs that were coming about at the very height of like the repression that was happening with Somoza. And so these were the ways that people were able to speak out through culture and through song. And um, uh, Carlos Mejia Godoy was a very important part of that because, I mean, I think I th we were having a conversation earlier like about how this was part of what kept people going when things were really difficult. Um, the armed conflicts kind of escalated. I wasn't around, so I can't really t I can't really speak to it. But um, from all the things that I've read, like this was one of the f some of the ways of speaking out. And um, as so many people did in that time in the in the seventies, um, people were. It seems to me from from the research that I've done, like, and from even talking to my parents who are not really pro Sandinista at all, um, that it's. It was a time where um, everybody was so down with the revolution, even people that you wouldn't that are, that you wouldn't have thought were down, because it was like such a bad situation with the the dictator that it was just like a different spirit. And then the in 1979, the revolution triumphed, and they were able to um, take out Somoza, and um, and that's what started a bunch of different social movements. And part of the social movements were were all these songs talking about. Um, the way that the world could be, the way that our society could be. Talking a lot about inequality and talking a lot about the issues, the, the justice issues of the time. Um, so the Mejia Godoy's were really important. Actually, I say Mejia Godoy's uh, plural because he also had a brother and they were both very involved in this. But Carlos Mejia Godoy was very important, especially with his band, uh, Los de la Palanca Guina. Um, they would actually tour internationally. They went to Spain a bunch of times and stuff like that. And they did a bunch of different um projects and a lot of the people that actually were part of this band were people like very very common like people that had grown up in el campo that had very little education or anything but they were singers and they all wrote songs that were about different campaigns happening at the time um so um one of the things that i wanted to so um so there's like there there all of the songs are really littered with a lot of um they're just filled with um a lot of references to war, like war and soldiers and fighting. Um, a lot of references to the campo and being outside and in nature and really talking about the common people. A lot of focus on the common people, the person that is um, the downtrodden, the, the people that have been left behind by society basically at this point. Um, and, um, What, what do you what, what did you say? What what how was it? Mm. Yeah. Um so there was two there were two things that I wanted to point point out. Well one is the alphabet um the literacy campaign that they did, the Sandinista did. Um 
this was also this is a really big deal this was probably like their biggest accomplishment after the revolution everybody like all kinds of people people with money people with education everybody up the the scales were participating in this um in this move out to the country they basically people were going out to educate people um, because a lot of the illiteracy existed out in the fields and out in the in the country and so people were from Manawa and from other bigger cities were going out um, to teach people how to read and this was like a really big movement and part of the reading movement also included lots of things about the revolution lots of um, the values of the revolution and um, the songs went hand in hand with that so that was one of the there was a couple of songs about about um, about the literacy campaign as well and so um, but another really cool, I think one of the most interesting aspects of the song Nika is um, this thing called, um, so the, the guys, uh, Carlo Mejia Godoy and Los de la Palanca Huina, they wrote, uh, they wrote a, so um, a whole album called uh, La Misa Campesina. And it was basically the mass parts, but done in like, all the folk traditions of Nicaragua. So they actually grabbed traditions from not just from the West Coast, but also from the East Coast of Nicaragua. And they tried to make a CD, uh, like our, a complete album and a mass. So they did like all of the parts of the mass to do it completely based on this. And they were all using, again, like common words, things that people would say, using um, nature to kind of like convey all of that. So we're actually going to do a song from La Misa Campesina. Um, this is actually probably my favorite song from these guys. It's called Cristo de la Palacahuina. And Palacahuina um, is actually a part. It's in the mountains, and it's actually close to where um, it's just like a little town. I think that... Um, Carlo Mejia Godoy just picked to be like the setting for his all his songs. He wasn't from there, but he was from around there, and um, and it's it was really an area of the of the country that felt um, the revolution very strongly. Like felt a lot of this, uh, like a lot of the fighting, but also felt a lot of the um, the benefits of it. So, give me one second. I promise you tuning will make it better for everyone. Sangre, sangre, fuego, ah. 
about radical man this guy this this song is saying that christ is gonna be a a soldier (laughs) yeah isn't that cool i mean it's kind of genius so actually the history with this um misa campesina is that um it was it was written and then it was actually banned by the the catholic church um along with um this guy who's Fer, uh, Father Fernando Cardenal, um, there were two priests that were very involved in the revolution and they both got like sort of banned or excommunicated. And then they got similar to the ch- to the Misa Campesina, which was like banned for a while in Nicaragua and wasn't played in, in Catholic churches. Um, it got kind of, it kind of came back. I actually had to call my mom and be like, but I've heard these songs before. How could they have been banned? Where would I have heard them? And apparently they've kind of been coming back and making their way back into um, the churches now that the revolution has is over, you know, um, or like that period is over because everything was like super politicized at the time. And so this was really politicized. But now people can play it in mass because I've definitely heard the songs and I don't think I've gone to any rallies where they were any like outside of Catholic church things so um but the same thing actually a similar thing happened with um the, fa- the cardenales uh, the fathers that were very involved with the revolution one of them's a poet and he runs a um like a artist commune in this island in the middle of the lake which i really want to go to um and they him and this one I, this one's the one i just died i think one of them just died and then the other one's still that that's that's ernesto oh this is it this is Ernesto. Oh, okay. I thought that was Fernando. Okay, sorry. Good thing you're here. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, but they actually both uh, uh, the Pope right now just let them back in. So it was like tw- twenty or thirty years of uh, being outside the church, and they came back in. Yeah, Viva el Papa Francisco. So, so that's interesting. I mean, I think that's kind of the really hard thing about all of this for me as a person born during this time is that it was like we were thrown into a political situation without knowing anything about it and the only sources that you have at the beginning of your life are your parents and then your parents tell you these are the evil people and these are the good people and then you like grow up and then you realize like you can figure that out for yourself and then you realize you maybe don't always agree with what your parents are saying but you that's like what you've been fed your whole life so it's really interesting um because it's not it's really hard to talk to people about it because everybody's so involved was so involved with the war i mean the war conflict like tore families apart i have uncles that fought on both sides like very intensely and in, uh, fought on both sides and then both of the, like all those uncles also totally have abandoned those beliefs by now and so it's a really weird thing to to really be able to examine but um but I'm really appreciative of being able to do that through music because I think that's like a really cool venue to be able to do that. So, um, cool. So we're basically at the end of my, my presentation. I just want to say a couple things about um, Songnika and the the future of the genre. 
a lot of people that are in my generation aren't like as interested in Songnika anymore um, for a few reasons, but um, but I think the most important one is that external influences are again kind of coming into Nicaragua and everybody that's young is like how I was when I was living there and I wanted to listen to the music from other parts of the world and I really didn't take much of an interest in what was um, mine at the time, right? So I think that's one of the bis most important ones. Um, the other thing that I'll just point out is that I realized that women were totally lacking in a lot of the history around at least the music part of the revolution. Um, at least the Songnika part, I mean, I know there was a couple people, but in terms of like, I've been, everybody that's highlighted as the most important at least, there's like no women on the list. I know that there were, there were women there, but um, so that's some of the stuff that I just feel like maybe it's a, it's a little bit of a boys club thing, so. That happens too, that happened too with, um, actually when I was learning, uh, when I took my marimba class, part of the reason I took it from like the one, apparently there's only a couple of women that play marimba professionally in Nicaragua, and part of the reason is that it's passed on from father to son, and so a lot of women don't get um, included in that. I just wanted to make sure I put that in this presentation. It's not really part of what is going on, but it's something that I feel every time I go home that it's not really, you know, women, especially women instrumentalists and songwriters, they have people that sing, um, but I, I think that's kind of like not as part of, of the culture that women be out in front like that. Um, so we're gonna finish with one last song that I wrote in a song Nika, song Nika style. And this is my own little attempt here to to keep the tradition alive. And uh, it's been really exciting to do that because uh, I've been pl I, I, I just went to Nicaragua and I played a tour and most of the music that I do is um, it's bilingual folk rock. So it's kind of like folky and rocky and I've got even some like American country songs and stuff. But um, but this one was really exciting to play in Nicaragua because I felt like I was actually engaging in a tradition that was a lot more mine than some of the other traditions I engaged in. So um, I'm really excited about that and to share that with you. And so the lyrics to this song are actually, I actually, I, they're not there. Yeah, sorry. I didn't include this one. Um, the lyrics to this song are actually a poem um, by one of the most important poet, uh, poets that Nicaragua has ever produced. Uh, his name is Ruben Darío, and he's basically, him and Sandino are like the most important figures um, to Nicaragua. Like you'll go into any building and it'll be, it doesn't matter what building, there'll be a, a picture of Sandino and a picture of Ruben Darío. And so uh, most everybody in Nicaragua learns a Ruben Darío poem at some point. And this is the one that I knew. And I was actually walking the Bloom Bars to come and host the open mic, and I and I thought to myself, I should um, I should recite some poetry, and then I was like, well, maybe I should do Ruben Darío poetry, and then I started thinking about this song, and then the melody came, so I wrote a song. <laughs> um, so this one's, I guess it's uh, it's called it's based on a, a a poem called Del Tropico, which describes a tropical morning in the tropics. Tropical morning in the tropics. Yeah, sorry. Okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> La mañanita me agarra el aire por la nariz Los perros ladran, un chico grita Y una muchacha gorda y bonita Junto una piedra huele maíz Un mozo trae por un sendero Sus herramientas y su morral Otro con caite y sin sombrero Busca una vaca con su ternero Para ordeñarla junto al corral Sabanero 
for coming. I, I guess, uh, do you have any questions? I don't know. I, I bet you you can answer them better than I can. I've been like cramming like it's like a test up here. Um, do we do we have any questions? I'm, tr I'm trying. <laughs> Are we good? Oh, there's a question in the back. Oh, yeah. That gets all complicated. It's like a, it's like musical chairs. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I tried to, like, I was, like, trying to do history and, like, not do history too much because it gets, like, really back and forth. But so basically, so um, the Sandinistas, well, I'll say Sandin the Sandinistas were in power in the 80s. Um, so when the ri revolution triumphed in 79, there was a time where they, like, kind of co-governed and there were a bunch of people that governed. And then eventually the Sandinistas ended up taking over. My impression, I'm not going to get political, but my impression is that it's because they were in charge of the military, and so then they ended up, um, there was like a time where there was like a triumvirate, but then that kind of dissolved. I think some of them, some of the people of the, of that were ruling walked away, and then it ended up being like only Sandinista run um, for the remainder of the 80s. And without getting into like any other like policy issues, it seems to me like most of the, at the beginning, it was like a like everybody really qualified kind of as this part of the Sandinista game, and then like as time went on, like people kind of like kind of fell off um, at different junctures, and so even people that were part like the Carlos Mejia Eloy, he was part of the Sandinista party during the eighties, and he was like part of the Ministry of Culture, and um, but in the nineties when the uh, when Daniel Ortega, who's currently currently the president, kept running again, he actually some of the intellectuals from the Sandinista movement formed another movement called the Movimiento Renovar Sandinista, like the, I guess, uh, reno renovated, <laughs> redone Sandinista party. And it was kind of like a lot of the intellectuals that had felt that the Sandinistas, the original Sandinistas had kind of like lost their way um, on some of the principles. And, um, but yeah, so you're correct. So the, the, the party that's in right now is the original Sandinista party. So it's Daniel Ortega, who was also president during the 1980s and he's been there I think he's been there six years now there's supposed to be an election at the end of this year but I don't think anybody's running against him so he's probably gonna stay there despite the fact that the Constitution says it's, he's only supposed to be there one term but Constitution Constitution <laughs> <laughs> up here in the front I don't know if I can represent that point of view at all. I haven't lived in Nicaragua for like 16 years or something now. So, um, so I, I don't know. I don't know if I can speak to that. Um, I do think that the revolution was really important for women. I mean, women were out there fighting in part of the, in the revolution. Uh, this was also happening during, um, like, like the liberation movement in the States. And so I think some of that stuff was, 
was coming across. I don't know. Maybe you know a little more about this than I do during the revolution. Because you were there, right? Yeah, I lived with what, you, what year were you there? I was there 88 to 90. It's actually really a harsh law right now, even. Yeah. yeah, it's a really not not part of. My, my uh, husband, the feminist, would say, guess what I just discovered? Women are in Nicaragua's law under the section for furniture and other immo <laughs> immovable ob objects, other immovable property. We were, we're oh, yeah. So it was a, yeah, it was a, it, it's a different take on feminism. But once you're there a while, you realize that, um, stability for the family, you know, the possibility of maybe being able to marry instead of being another camp follower like me. Uh, you know, this is uh, it, the, the very, the very beginnings of women not being property were important. Women didn't marry very much. It was, if you had a second name, it meant that you knew who your father was. And so you should, you show it off because if, <laughs> you know, if you're not, you wouldn't, I wouldn't just be Christina Anderson. I was Christina Anderson de Melendez. I had a man, you know. Yeah. So uh, it's, let's see. Yeah, yeah I don't yeah. know. I don't know if Una you noticed. Una mujer abnegada. You just say, still say that? Which one? Una mujer abnegada. Uh, uh, abnegate, a woman who is totally submissive to submissive her husband. Is what it means. Submissive to her husband. Who abnegates herself. Totally self sacrificing. Saintly was the ideal. So to just to get anything, we're, we're talking the very beginnings. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, just hang out and do it for a second. Oh, do you have another question? Oh, okay. Anybody? <laughs> uh, yeah, you mentioned communism in the beginning. Yeah. And that happened when you were, when you were leading the country or when your parents. So were the leading? Sandinista movement would deemed itself as like a Marxist-Leninist communist uh. thing. During the Cold War, basically Nicaragua was like, it was like the front lines of the Cold War. So you had the U.S. and the USSR, right? And they had, it was kind of like a proxy war for what they were doing. So the Russians would help, would help the Sandinistas. And then there was a Contra revolution. That's where it's, the, that's known as the Contras, which were U.S. backed. Um, contra revolutionary, so people that didn't agree with the revolution having happened, and they were armed forces, and they were uh, funded illegally by the United States. If you've ever heard of the Iran Contra scandal, the U.S. was selling weapons illegally in Iran to fund a war without passing it through Congress, and that was during Ronald Ronald Reagan. And uh, yeah, there's a really good book called Blood of Brothers that goes through like all of how. Um, how they discovered this illegal war. It was like basically a journalist who like found an American camp in southern Honduras and it's really kind of crazy um, how they were able to do that. So that was like a really one of the big scandals during the Reagan ad administration and, um, and, and and maybe basically it was like both the USSR and the US were, were fighting a war inside of Nicaragua with Nicaraguan people, Nicaraguan lives at stake, Nicaraguan destruction all of that, if that makes sense. I mean, to like like super broaden it, to, to super glaze the surface on that. Well, the yeah. communist thing was, there were three factions during the revolution. And one was, some people were hardcore communists, and others weren't. And in 1983, the, there was a change in Can the Can you use the microphone? Because we have, uh, yeah. we actually are <laughs> yeah. the, There were different, three different factions in the revolution, there were the there was the Guerra Popular Prolongada, the the pop popular prolonged people's war, uh, and then there were the Terceristas, which is Daniel Ortega's faction, which said make compromises. Uh, you need the rich people to help you. Um, and what happened was in 1983, the the Marxist-Leninist people 
who were more with the Tomas Borges, the Ministry of the Interior, and the popular prolonged war, they brought they they went out of favor, and the terceristas, who was, were Daniel Ortega's practical make compromises uh, group, won out in the Sandinista Party, and then the Sandinistas started to try to reach out to the United States, but by that time it was too late. They, they were getting military assistance through Cuba. The Russians didn't go directly to Nicaragua with uh, the military aid. They sent stuff through Cuba because the Cubans spoke Spanish and could operate a little better. The Russians didn't get along with the Nicaraguans at all. So, <laughs> so the, yeah, the Communist Party was I wonder actually, why. They have so much in common. <laughs> well, they were, they were pissed off because the Nikas kept crashing their cars in the war zones, and, and in, it, it was just really <laughs> horrible what they did to the Russian cars. <laughs> oh, those Russian cars were still around when I moved back in I'm 92. Sure. Yeah, so, so, yeah. But if you talk to a conservative family like a Lakayo or a Zelaya, they're going to throw up their hands and say, it's the communists, it's the communists, because after the revolution came and people fled and went to um, uh, Florida and yeah. to and, and maybe some to Louisiana and some to California. Why are you predicting my life? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, you're like Kyle, so you have some family who would be who would not be Sandinista. Some I was were. born in New Orleans. Yeah. yeah, yeah, New Orleans, right? You're like Kyle from New Orleans, right? So then, um, for these people, um, their house was gone, and some Sandinista person or someone like me, even worse, was living in it and working for free. You know, and so they were horrified. They, for the, for their perspective. It was communism. Yeah, so there was, uh, I mean, one of the big, the most controversial and things that they, that the Sandinistas did was, uh, was the, the confiscation of land. So my, in my understanding, again, you're going to probably <laughs> give me another thing, but um, my understanding of it is at the beginning, it was like, let's take this farm that's owned by one family and make it a cooperative and make it um, so that there's more like profit sharing and responsibility sharing and all this stuff, right? Cool, that's great, right? But as time went on, and I don't know when La Piñata happened, but this is the part that 19, I... 1990. Yeah, so after when... The elections so after the elections, there's basically an election. And by the way, as much as people talk bad about the Sandinistas, like one of the cool things about the Sandinistas is that they had the first democratic turnover in Nicaraguan history, if you can imagine that. I mean, all the other turnovers were like oustings and murders and things. So, um, so... They had a democratic election and they lost. And before they left power, they went around and they stole all this stuff from people. They just would go into people's homes and just take them. And then the comment, like the high Sandinista people, ended up with, you know, really nice homes. So that's the part that is the irony of like the communist revolution. And that's the big criticism that people have, which I'm sure you're going to say something about now. <laughs> is it awesome? Yeah, so the piñata. I mean, I I was brought up knowing about la piñata, the piñata being, you know, a piñata, but basically la piñata is known as like when everybody took everybody else's house, sort of. On la piñata. <laughs> I think it's off. <laughs> <laughs> he owned like like a third or half of the country it was ridiculous Thank you. 
Yeah, my mom's a real estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> She's yeah. yeah good. Cool. Well, I don't have to bore everybody with all of the history. If you guys want to stick around and chat, we can, but I don't want to be okay if people want to go. So thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you for being my audience. You were like my guinea pigs, and I appreciate that. Um, but I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I hope you had some good music. And uh, hope to see you around Bloom Bars again. Come on out for an open mic or a songwriting workshop, and I'll be around. And stick around and say hi. Thanks. <laughs>